Hotline Miami is a top-down action shooter video game developed by Denaton Games and published by Devolver Digital. The game is set in Miami during 1989, and to explain it briefly, you get cryptic phone calls that give you an address, after which you go to said address, put on an animal mask, and kill everyone inside, while also suffering from hallucinations and constantly seeing weird janitors. Like a lot of games, Hotline Miami and its sequel have a convoluted storyline that you really need to pay attention to to understand. And with the recent craze of the icebergs, or at least I hope it's recent because I don't know when this video will come out, it seems like a good time to break down some theories, facts, and some niche little trivia that will hopefully clear your view of the game's story, or simply entertain you. Most of the entries in this video were taken from these two icebergs that had already been made, while also adding some entries of my own. Credit to main Game Boy and Crazy Jaden. Like most icebergs, the top is well-known facts and theories, while the deeper sections are lesser-known information. On the bottom left, there will be a 50 Blessings logo. The less stripes it has, the less certain I am or the less believable the theory I'm talking about is. While on the bottom right, there is going to be text indicating if something is a fact or if it's a theory. Before we start, I have to give out an obligatory spoiler warning for both Hotline Miami 1 and 2, and if you haven't played the games or haven't finished them and don't want to get spoiled, click off this video and come back some other time. So with everything out of the way, let's explore the iceberg. Jacket's name is Richard. Throughout both games, the masks you unlock quite often have matching names with their owner. The Jake mask belongs to Jake, the Cory mask belongs to Cory, the Mark mask belongs to Mark, and so on and so forth. Due to this, it's theorized that Jacket, the protagonist of the first game who we never learned the name of, is actually called Richard, since the first mask you are given is named Richard. This is not to be confused with the entity known as Richard, who is a separate character from Jacket. Payday 2 Jacket Payday 2 is a game developed by Overkill Software and published by 505 Games. The game has a Hotline Miami DLC that includes Jacket. The character is canon to the Payday 2 universe, but it should be noted that he's probably not the same Jacket from the Hotline Miami games. And I say that he isn't the same Jacket because, well... So think of Payday 2 Jacket as an alternate timeline version. Russell Mask Russell is a mask that is exclusive to the console versions of Hotline Miami 1. The mask can be found near the dumpster at the end of the Metro Prelude. If used, the mask turns the game black and white, the only other color being red. It doesn't give any special abilities, but the visual effect it gives is pretty cool nonetheless. 50 Blessings 50 Blessings is an ultra-nationalist terrorist group and the main antagonist of the Hotline Miami games. They front as a peaceful organization who simply disagree with the Russo-American coalition, which is how they trick their members into signing up for their newsletter. Once the members sign up for the newsletter, they start receiving mysterious phone calls and are mailed an animal mask. The addresses are hideouts of the Russian Mafia, or businesses affiliated with the Russians. 50 Blessings does this as a way to rise tension between Americans and Russians, and eventually ruin the coalition, so they can rebuild the country as they want. Two of the more recognizable members are the janitors, who are actually modeled for the two developers of the game, Jonathan Soderstrom and Dennis Vadim. They keep an eye out on their operatives and are the ones behind the phone calls, keeping a network of phones in the sewers. Hotline Mimi 1's Conflicting Endings Hotline Mimi 1 has two endings, one of which you achieve after beating Jacket's storyline. During Chapter 7 of the game, Jacket is sent to the phone home building to kill Biker. The two get into a fight, which ends with Jacket being victorious and killing Biker. After beating Jacket's storyline and going through the credits, you get to play as Biker, who turns out to have been in the phone home building because he wanted to trace the source of the calls. After another replay of the fight, this time Biker wins and kills Jacket instead. These conflicting endings have been great debate within the community as to which one is canon and actually happened. Since both Jacket and Biker are in Hotline Miami 2, it seems that neither must have happened. The first game has a theme of unreliable narrators, as Jacket turned out to have been in a coma during most of his playable missions. This, of course, puts doubt on his recollection of events, but it's agreed that a lot of what he remembers did actually happen, minus the weird hallucinations. Biker, on the other hand, seems to have been on drugs during the day of the fight. This puts doubt on his recollection of events. 
It's usually agreed that the two did really fight at the phone home building, but neither of them won, and neither of them died. Jackie remembers the event wrong because of the head trauma that put him in a coma, making him believe that he killed Biker, while Biker remembers the event wrong because he was on drugs, and since he was also repeatedly hit in the head during the fight, that also adds to it. It's also important to know that the reason Richter was sent to assassinate Jacket, which is why he ended up in a coma in the first place, was because Jacket failed to kill Biker, and 50 blessings wanted no loose ends. If you were to say Jacket's ending was the true canon one, it wouldn't make sense because why would 50 blessings have even sent Richter to kill Jacket if Jacket did succeed in killing Biker? So in short, it's likely that both endings happened, but Jacket and Biker didn't die at the hands of one another. Joan. In chapter 5 of the first game, you can find a crowbar on the first floor of the house. This crowbar is exclusive to this level and never appears again. If you leave with the crowbar and go around the back of the house, you will find an entrance to the sewers. Using the crowbar, you are able to remove the lid and go down into the sewers. This is where you encounter a man laying on the ground, bleeding to death, with an alligator mask beside him. This is Jones, another operative of 50 Blessings. If you approach him, he starts talking about how he thinks he gets it now, that everything that's been happening is all a bad dream. After this, you can pick up the Jones mask, and all that's left is leaving the sewers. The Theme of Legacy Hotline Miami 2 has a recurring theme of legacy. This is primarily shown through the sun, whose father was killed by Jacket in the first game. With most of their men slaughtered and the head of the organization dead, they were practically done. This left the son feeling the need to keep the legacy going and to rebuild the Russian mafia from the ground up. This is tackled more head on in the level Blood Money, where the son sees a vision of Richard and his father. The father confronts son and asks him why he's doing this, to which son tells him that he wants to make him proud. The father responds to him that such things don't matter, and that he hasn't changed. He's just like his old man, and he won't get it until it's too late. This is all then put in contrast with the fans, who support Jacket's actions and believe that he did the city a favor by getting rid of the Russian Mafia. Wanting to keep Jacket's legacy going, they decide to put on animal masks as well, and go into the streets of Miami to continue where Jacket left off. Since at this point there is no more Russian Mafia, they target low-life thugs, and their actions don't change much. It's pretty obvious that most of them are simply doing this for the thrill, and not for justice, because if they wanted justice, they would have targeted the Colombian cartel, who have taken over the market after the end of the Russian Mafia. The fans' obsession of following Jacket's footsteps and feeling the thrill goes as far as to murder the henchman, simply because he's a part of the Russian Mafia. After stealing the henchman's phone, they get a call from Sun, who thinks he's talking to the henchman. He invites them to their new location, with no idea that the fans are on the other side of the line. The fans, thinking they have finally been contacted by 50 Blessings, travel to the location to finally make their mark and to get rid of the Russian Mafia once again. This is their big shot, their opportunity for justice, their opportunity to continue Jacket's legacy. Of course, this doesn't go right, as they are murdered by a drugged up son, fulfilling the son's wish to avenge his father by killing the remaining masked people. The son succeeded at his goal, but at what cost? Norse Mythology Connections In the level Apocalypse, you play as the son, who in a drug-induced state goes on a rampage within his own building. The son slaughters what seem to be demons and supernatural animals, who in reality are his own men and the fans. After killing everyone, you end up on the roof with the rainbow bridge in front of you. The golden gates open, and you step onto the fiery bridge, which quickly turns into a neon void. In reality, the sun had just stepped off the building, falling down and killing him. Just as quickly as the Russian Mafia rose to the top, it just as quickly crumbled down once again. This fulfills Richard and Father's prophecy. The sun succeeded but at the cost of his life, and in the end, none of it mattered. The rainbow bridge that the sun hallucinates is a reference to Norse mythology. 
In Norse mythology, Bivrist is a rainbow bridge that leads from Midgard, which is Earth, to Asgard, where the gods live. This can be seen as a play on the sun being the new kingpin, the drug god of Miami. Another possible connection to Norse mythology is Richard himself, who could be based on the three roosters that alert the beginning of Ragnarok, the apocalypse, and the final battle. Henchman's Backstory The henchman is a fan favorite amongst the community. Though his part in the game was brief, he left a long-lasting impact on the story. His backstory has been a topic of conversation, as we never learn much about him. One theory is that he's a Colombian, as his sprite's skin color is similar to the Colombian sprites. Though a more intriguing theory is that he's a war veteran, having partaken in the Hawaii War. His skin color is similar to the Russian soldiers, and would also explain his great marksmanship and skill, as he would have had a lot of experience. Hotline Miami 3 Easter Egg after beating Hotline Miami 2 and letting the credits roll fully, not skipping them, you will be briefly greeted by a Hotline Miami 3 menu before the VHS rewinds and takes you back to the Hotline Miami 2 menu. This was a joke and easter egg by Denethon, who have confirmed that they have no plans in making a Hotline Miami 3. Probably poking fun on movie franchises, who usually have an unnecessary amount of sequels. Jacket through Richter the Pipe and Release In the level release, Richter is visited in prison by the janitors, the ones working for 50 blessings. They have changed their appearance, causing Richter to not remember them, after which they tell him that they're going to tie up some loose ends. He is then taken to the prison courtyard, where he is attacked by a prisoner with a 50 blessings tattoo, who has been sent to kill Richter. During the fight, a pipe is thrown in the courtyard from the crowd, which Richter picks up and uses to kill the attacking prisoner. A theory in fan headcanon is that Jacket threw Richter the pipe, as a way to show that he has forgiven Richter for killing his girlfriend. Richter never wanted to commit the crimes he did, but was coerced to doing them as 50 Blessings was threatening his mother. He clearly showed remorse to Jacket during the assault level in the first game, which made Jacket sympathize with him and let him canonically survive. Tony's Mask In the level tension, once you reach the second floor you will spot another masked operative, being interrogated by the Russians. The man is wearing a Tony mask and is wired to a bomb, leading to the fanbase calling him Tension Tony. To finish the level, you have to shoot the door, causing the bomb to explode, killing everyone inside the room. In Hotline Miami 2, you get to play as Tony, the leader of the fans. Tony wears the perfectly fitting Tony mask, but is different from the first game. His is darker and is bloodied up. This led to the fan theory that Tony from Hotline Miami 2 is wearing Tension Tony's mask, having stolen it from the crime scene. There is not much evidence leading to this, other than the fact that Tony's mask is darker in color, much like Tension Tony's, and that it is bloodied, which would make sense if it survived an explosion. Cocaine Cowboy Cocaine Cowboy is the original prototype of Hotline Miami. The game is very similar looking to the final product, with some distinct differences. For example, Jacket has grey hair and doesn't wear a mask. The enemies of the game wear blue varsity jackets, inspired by Beverly Hills Cop. These sprites were later repurposed and turned into the gang members in Hotline Miami 2. A lot of the maps are retooled for Hotline Miami, one of which turned into the second floor of Full House. The Colonel is the founder of 50 Blessings. In the intro of Casualties, Beard and the Ghost Wolves are approached by the Colonel, who is wearing a panther's ripped skin on his head. He tells the Ghost Wolves that being an animal is their true nature that humans are all animals, being sent to the slaughter, fighting a war that doesn't even have a point anymore, following orders and killing just because they're told, and that they all continue to kill and go to war because deep down, they enjoy it. On the panther's head, a 50 Blessings logo is carved. This is the first ever chronological sighting of the 50 Blessings logo, which, along with the colonel's words, gives a pretty strong case that he has at least had a play in 50 Blessings creation. During the credits of the game, the Russian and American presidents are both murdered during a press conference. This attack was led by a US Army general, which pretty much puts no doubt that the colonel was behind it. The Bar of Broken Heroes In the intro of Subway, you play as Evan inside his home. Before you leave, if you click the phone unprompted, you will find out Evan has received a voicemail. The voicemail is in relation to Evan's book with a person on the other line telling Evan to meet him at a bar called Hank's. 
Once you complete Subway, you will be taken to the bar. At Hank's, you can find most playable characters from the game. The fans, who are drinking and seem distraught, possibly at the outcome of the level Death Wish. The son and the henchman, with son drinking as the henchman refills his glass. Jake, wiping his nose with an American flag. Manny Pardo, who is staring at his reflection intensely inside the bathroom. The bum from the previous game, who is dumpster diving outside the bar. Martin Brown, reading a script. H.M. Hammerin, a character who doesn't appear in the main storyline and is an easter egg. Beard, cleaning some glasses. And finally, Biker, who was the one who called you on the phone. Even though it's only been two years since Hotline Amy 1, Biker looks much older. He has an overgrown beard and long hair, sporting the scar given to him by Jacket and neighbors. Biker tries to tell Evan that there was a big conspiracy behind the phone calls, but he can't quite remember it. After finding out the truth, Biker ran away to the desert, becoming paranoid. In the desert, that's where Biker saw him, saying how he had never been scared of anything in his life, but that person gave him chills. After that, Biker lost the will to fight. Evan doesn't believe Biker and thinks he may have had too much to drink, so he refuses to pay Biker, causing him to get mad and to tell Evan off. After this, Evan leaves. The Bar of Broken Heroes is a surreal meta commentary on the characters of the games. The Easter egg is a reference to the painting Boulevard of Broken Dreams, which depicts famous deceased celebrities hanging out in a cafe. There's quite a bit to unpack here. The cars outside the bar are all weathered and broken, alluding to the nuke that hits Miami. Beard, Jake, and the bum are all dead by this point in the story, while Jacket and Richter are both not present. The bar, Hanks, is named after Barnes, one of the ghost wolves. In the outro of Ambush, Barnes uses the code name Hank, and in Stronghold, he talks about how he would like to open a bar once the war is over. Given all this, it's implied the bar is less of an actual event within the story and more of a surreal way to show off the personalities of the characters. So this was part one of the iceberg. I hope you liked this video and if you did, consider subscribing. Part two is going to come very soon.